Hey, Hammy here, coming to you with the last video of our evolution chapter in which we want to look at macroevolution and some things that, uh, different topics underneath that, like speciation, uh, timing of evolution, and uh, isolating mechanisms. So one of the first things we have to do is we have to define the process of speciation. Okay, speciation is the process by which new species evolve. Okay, how do we get new things on this ball of rock we call Earth? Okay, that process is called speciation. Well, to go kind of back step even further, what is the biological definition of a species? Okay, the biological definition of a species are a group of organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring. Okay, key there being fertile offspring. Uh, two examples uh, that we see uh, that humans have done, if you take a horse and a donkey and you cross them, you get a mule. And you'd be like, oh, well, are horse and donkey the same species? Because look, they can make offspring. Well, the mule, okay, the mule here is infertile. Uh, sometimes they, the F1 might be fertile, but then the next generation of mule then is often infertile. So we consider horse and donkey uh, separate species. Even though you can make a hybrid, the hybrid, it can't perpetuate that line. It can't keep going. Uh, you may have heard of a tigon or a liger, okay, which is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Okay, and we get these really big cats, okay? and they're like, ah, cool. And some of them might be fertile, but the key here, not in nature. Okay, the lions over here are in Africa, and these over here are over in Asia, the tigers. So the chance of those two in nature coming together and producing a liger or tigon depends which is the mom, which is the dad, not going to happen. Okay, so we consider the lion and the tiger separate species. Okay, there's two types of, I guess, ways um, that we want to look at. There's more than two, but that we want to be concerned about in Biology 1 class, and that's allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric, you can remember, allopatric always involves a geographical barrier of some kind. So the example a lot of books give are the kaibab and the abert squirrel, okay, where you have uh, the kaibab is on the north rim of the Grand Canyon and the abert squirrel is on the south rim. So at one time some got to the other side and they are starting to, the genetic differences are building up and building up and building up because they obviously they can't get across the canyon to interbreed anymore. So this population over here is becoming more genetically different than this population over here. Okay, right now they're subspecies. Eventually these things, if separated long enough, these things might become separate species. We'll, okay, we'll have witnessed speciation occurring. Uh, another uh, way that this happens, geographical barrier would be like islands like on the Galapagos, where things get blown from island to island and there's very different habitats on each. So they each adapt to their island and then they become more and more and more different. Okay, they become isolated from each other. Um, so things, yeah, like rivers, uh, mountain ranges, okay, mountain ranges as well, would all be kind of keep things isolated from each other geographically and then they separate on their own, be, might become different species. The second type of speciation is sympatric speciation, okay? Sympatric speciation is where new species arise without being geographically, physically separated from each other, okay? Uh, we've seen this with the hawthorn flies. Uh, the hawthorn flies uh, were originally in, the, in North America, and they would be on these hawthorn fruits, okay? These hawthorn fruits down here. And when apples, when apple trees were introduced in the United States, these two trees often grew close to each other. So these flies lay their larvae on the fruits, and then the larvae uh, use the fruit of the hawthorn for food, 
as they you know go through the meta before they go through the metamorphosis into a fly. Well, some of the flies saw these red apples and they started laying their eggs on apples. And the offspring, the maggots and stuff would eat the apples. And over time, what we've seen is between the hawthorn and the apples, uh, the two species uh, don't really intermate anymore because when the, there's a very short time when the hawthorn fruit and the apple fruit, when they bloom and when they actually have fruit, uh, there's kind of a timing difference. Uh, from when the two have fruit on them. So the two often don't meet. And so the hawthorn flies, these two species of hawthorn flies, are becoming more and more genetically different as time goes by. And over time, we might actually see them become two different species, uh, just because they sort of found different food sources and they're co-evolving with those plants uh, to coincide with when those fruits are available which doesn't coincide when the two different subspecies uh, will, would actually meet and be able to mate. Another thing we want to look at is what are some of the isolating mechanisms? What makes things become so different okay, that they, uh, they will not interbreed anymore, that they become separate species? Okay. Uh, so whether it's sympatric or allopatric speciation of how they're separated, uh, what makes them, if they do come in contact again, what makes them not interbreed anymore? Okay. One could be behavioral. An example I like to use, and I'll play these songs in class, are the Western and Eastern meadowlarks. Okay, now, just upon visual appearance, the two look very similar, right? And we're like, well, why can't those interbreed? Well, if you would listen to their songs, their songs are different enough because they were kind of on the east and west side of the Mississippi. Uh, their songs are different enough that they don't recognize each other. Where their habitats do overlap now, they don't recognize each other. So when a male is singing, and singing, and singing, and trying to find a mate, the females of the other one don't aren't attracted to that. They aren't interested in that because they don't recognize that song. Okay, so sometimes courtship rituals, whether that's a certain dance or a song or a certain style of feathers or something like that, uh, they don't recognize each other, so they won't interbreed anymore because of different behaviors. Okay, the next isolating mechanism very closely related to allopatric speciation is geographic isolation. Uh, one of uh, where geographical, obviously a physical barrier like water, river, mountains, islands, uh, which we talked about before, can actually separate creatures and then the variation builds up between them. Uh, one common example is the Californian salamanders. Okay, in the California salamanders, the original species up north here is this subspecies right here. Okay, just kind of brown, kind of drab. And as the salamanders moved down the coast, okay, they, are, they sort of were divided by this central valley. Some of them went more up into the mountains over here, and one went more down on the coastal plains down in here. And you'll notice that when they met up here at the bottom again, they are very, very different, okay? On the coastal plains, they kind of kept this drab appearance of sort of this reddish brownish that was kind of the best camouflage. Camouflage for the salamanders, whereas the ones that moved up into the mountains where there was more vegetation, they started to develop this marbling or these spots because they were better camouflage. And now you can make some hybrids down here at the bottom, but it's very much less common, okay? Uh, and so if this continues over time, again, those genetic differences can build up over time, and you might not even, they may not even recognize each other anymore, and they wouldn't interbreed, and we would consider them separate species. The third example of an isolating mechanism is temporal, okay? Now, just like look at the root word tempo, Okay, tempo means 
time. So these are things that mate or reproduce at different times of the day, month, or year, so that when one is re reproducing, the other is not. Uh, if we look at some frogs, okay, different species of frogs, if you look when the wood frog, okay, in the spring, the spring peepers, okay, where you hear them out there chirp, 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 and trying to find a mate, okay, the bullfrogs don't mate until later in June or July. So the bullfrogs are not interested when the wood frogs are trying to find a mate. Okay, so they will not interbreed because they are at different times of year. Uh, two pine trees, the bishop pine and the Monterey pine, okay, live in very similar places, uh, but they will not cross because one uh, has cones and pollen and cones earlier in the year and one has later in the year. So because of different times of year that they are sending out pollen, they, they do not cross, okay, because of different time or temporal isolation. And these types of things can cause things to become more and more and more different until they are considered separate species. Another topic in macroevolution is coevolution. Co means together. So when two things kind of evolve in response to each other. When changes happen in one, it will kind of force some changes to happen into the other because the two depend upon each other. And in other classes, right, we've learned that two things that depend upon each other are called symbiotic, symbiotic relationships, okay? An example of this would be flowering plants and their pollinators. Uh, if you look over here, is the Mata Gascar hawk moth. And the flower that it, I think it's an orchid that it pollinates. Okay, look at this long tongue. They can grow up to about 30 centimeters, which is over a foot long. Okay, so we're talking these long, long tongues. And then the flowers, the pollen tubes on these flowers have these really deep flower tubes. So that tongue is adapted. They're both adapted to each other. This has a long nectar tube and the hawk moth has a long tongue to reach down in there to get the nectar and stuff at the bottom. And as it does so, it brushes against the pollen out here, gets the pollen all over the moth, and when it goes to the next flower, it pollinates the flower. So we see this a lot of times in symbiotic relationships where two things kind of evolve in response to changes in each other. Final thing we want to discuss this chapter is the timing of the evolution. Okay, now we know it takes millions and millions of years, uh, but how that process happens over those millions of years, uh, there's two kind of thoughts on this. One is called gradualism, and one is called punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism, just like the root word sounds gradual, it says where evolution is slow, steady. Uh, so if you look down here, this would be the this would be the gradualist model down here. Okay, this is how, this is sort of what Darwin proposed right here, okay? That there's slow, steady changes over time from a common ancestor to the different things that we see today. Uh, but what in the late 1900s, okay, there's um, other people like Stephen Jay Gould, uh, paleontologists and stuff that uh, found fossils and the fossil record said, well, we don't have all these in-between things. So what they think may have happened is these things didn't evolve very much for a long period of time, stayed the same. And then when there were uh, periods of environmental change or habitat change, it caused kind of this short burst or rapid evolution. And then the environment stayed the, chain, stayed the same for a while, so you had these long, steady times of equilibrium, okay? And the fossil record sort of supports that idea a little bit better. So you have the same thing, and then it's punctuated with a period of rapid change, okay? Now rapid as in maybe thousands of years instead of million, millions, but then it stays the same for a long time, as long as the environment that they're adapted to stays very much the same. Okay, so just two different kind of ideologies on sort of how fast and how this process of speciation actually happens.
Okay, so I hope you have a good understanding of evolution after these videos. Again, we'll make sure to ask me if you have any questions about these ideas and, and what all this stuff means. And you can go back and review these videos uh, if you need to.